Welcome, Tim. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for having me. This is a little bit new for me. Normally, I speak at font conferences where I'm the, the web guy. And today, it seems to be almost the other way around. So if I'm saying things you already know and it's getting boring, please uh, tell me. And if I'm saying something that uh, assuming things you already know, which you don't, then also please just raise your hand. So, yes, I'm going to talk about fonts. Quickly, uh, something about who I am. Um, uh, I, I'm a, mostly I'm a type designer, so I make fonts. I'm running a little foundry in collaboration with my wife. And, well, we produce fonts, we design and produce fonts, and, of course, it's great if you can do that completely independently, publishing when you want, what you want, making all the decisions yourself. The price you have to pay as a type designer is getting into all these technical details, which, for type designers, technology is always more of a hassle. But anyway, that's the price you have to pay, and after I had uh, dug into all these technical things, I thought, oh, it's at least it would be nice if I could use it. And uh, when I was asked by Typekit whether I want to join in, I said, <clears throat> I said yes, of course. And uh, so I'm a consultant at Typekit now. They were last year they were bought by Adobe. And it's interesting. Most foundries know everything about fonts, but before web fonts, they knew hardly anything about the web. And Typekit is that company that comes from the web. They know everything about the web. But for them, dealing with fonts was a bit like uh, jumping in at the deep end. And of course, they got it to work very well. Um, well, I'm a little biased, but I would say almost they got it to work best. And so I'm working at Typekit. Um, at Typekit, also, I learned um, it's very interesting to learn how the web thinks, how the real web people think, because that's something, as a designer, you're not always used to. At Adobe, they always say, we want to work with the web, not against it. So part of what I learned there will be part of the talk today. But then um, being well-behaved is not always as much fun as being not so well-behaved. Sometimes hacks are nice. Hijacking something is nice. So this is a project I made for uh, FontShop International that's called the Font Fonter. I can show that live, so it allows you to hijack any website and display a website in a different font. So paint any external website in a different font. So I'm not criticizing the font choice, by the way, here of the official website. I'm just showing what would it look like if instead of the officially used ones, I think it's Myriad and Meta Serif, you could say, oh, I want to see the sans serif in basic Gothic and uh, the text um, face Tisa Web. Or let's see what that looks like in Meta, well-known font, font fonted. So you can browse the web in um, the fonts you like. That's one project, but let's get back to the more, um, uh, the more sober details. So we're talking about uh, web fonts. What are web fonts? That's when the fonts and the web get together. Are web fonts much different from normal fonts? Not really. It's mostly about, well, you know, packaging. I don't know whether you've experienced that you order something on the internet and, yeah, somehow they put one box around another box around another box and you wonder why. Um, well, I can tell you at least with fonts it's similar, but all these wrappings make more sense. So, what's a font? A font is basically a bunch of letters, plus, of course, extra special characters. Add a, a header, for example, an open type header that includes names. A font does not only have one name, although you think it should, but for historical reasons, there are lots of so called names records. And then open type fonts can have open type features, for example, small caps or um, ligatures, old style figures that define uh, when you switch to a different set of figures, for example, um, define which glyph is supposed to be substituted with another glyph. So you've got the header and the glyphs, and give it a name, .ttf, true type font, and you've got the font. 
Um, true type fonts have open type headers, so do open type OTFs. So you've got two different flavors of open type, really. One is called the true type flavored open type, and one is called the postscript flavored open type, or sometimes called CFF flavored because in its belly it contains a postscript font, really, that is then compressed again um, using the so-called compact font format, CFF. So it is contained within that. Um, so we've got OTF and TTF. They are the standard formats for desktop fonts today. And in fact, you can use them as web fonts as well. You can easily use a TTF or an OTF and use it on a website. That's no problem at all. But we are talking about real web fonts, of course. For example, EOT, that's Microsoft Embeddable Open Type. But it's not really completely different to a TTF. Um, when an EOT is generated, all that the program does is it adds a little header, a wrapper, and then the TTF is compressed using a special proprietary compression algorithm, and that's it. So the font is not really decompiled or disassembled and then reassembled into something else and uh, it's a web font but it is really just a normal font with a wrapper around it. Similar in the case of WAF, again you've got the header, uh, you've got the font is compressed, uh, WAF has a gzip compressed uh, font in, inside and in the case of WAF you also have uh, the so-called metadata uh, WAF is still not even an official W3C standard, although it is already widely used and works very well. And one of the things people were really discussing about is this metadata. Um, it's not finalized yet, but it will be things like when the browser supports it, you c the font con could contain information about like the designer or uh, where you could buy it, and then you can maybe show information about all the fonts on the page. So once that is implemented, it could become interesting. One thing about WAF is that by just looking at the file ending .wof, you don't know whether it contains a TTF, a true type flavored font, or an OTF, a postscript flavored font. Um, so from, from the file ending, uh, you couldn't tell. So uh, why do we have web fonts? Why don't we just use the plain fonts? We could. Uh, one reason is that uh, WAF and EOT is compressed, of course. That's an advantage on the web. We always want small data size. And from the Foundry's point of view, that's great because a WAF cannot be installed, simply ripped off the internet and installed on the computer. Same for EOT. And um, although this is a kind of what they often call garden fence protection, there are, of course, tools to extract an, a WAF um, but um, then at least it becomes a, a conscious effort and people really know I'm really doing something I'm sh I shouldn't do. So that's one reason why um, WAF and EOT are accepted by the, by the font industry. Um, um, although I have a feeling foundries are not really aware this is just a barrier between the web world and the printing world. You cannot use web fonts for print, but you can easily rip off any web font and then reuse it within the web. So there is no pro protection against that. Anyway, so we've got our WAF. We can easily load that, as you might know, uh, with CSS. There's an at font face syntax. Um, alternatively, we can also load that with base64. That means the font is uh, converted into a string, and then that string can be put straight into the CSS file uh, by using data URI. Uh, one advantage here would be that you uh, are reducing the number of requests to the server, so that could shave off a little bit of time, for, so it's a quicker experience for the user. And once again, for the foundries, that's interesting, because converting a base64 to the WAF and then extracting the font, it's just one hurdle more to overcome. Again, it is not extremely difficult, but it is one garden fence more. So base64 is optional, so is JavaScript. You can just load the fonts directly with CSS or using JavaScript, as it is done by um, many web font services, including Typekit, also Google Web Font Service offers that. Uh, one 
advantage of JavaScript is that you have more control over what happens until the font is loaded. Do you want a, a fallback font to show? That looks sometimes a bit ugly. That's called the flash of unstyled text, fault, when you have maybe one second of the fallback font and then it switches, so you can just say, display nothing. And another uh, advantage of using JavaScript to load the fonts is that you have different formats, as you know, EOT, WOF, some browsers still need plain fonts. And who makes the choice uh, which font the browser gets? If the choice is made by JavaScript in the browser, then the server doesn't need to make the decision. So it's a bit like saying, I'm going to McDonald's, and then at the till I'm saying, one Big Mac and a Coke without ice versus saying, oh, good morning, my name is Firefox Mac, and then the guy behind the counter says, ah, good morning, Mr. Mac, uh, let me see, oh, yes, I know what your favorite is. Oh, uh, would you like ketchup today? So that takes lots of time, of course, and if you serve really, really lots of fonts, then it is very handy if you can just transfer some of this computing that's necessary to make the decision um, to, the uh, to, to the browser and away from the server. Finally, um, as any static data, uh, fonts are static, um, they should be served as gzip. I have a feeling I don't need to explain to you how that works and what it is. So, lots of layers here around the font. Um, now I'm running out of space. Let's have a look um, at the browsers. The browsers unpack all that stuff, it works really well. And, um, but the problem is, not all browsers deal with the fonts in exactly the way. Hmm. Sounds familiar? Anyone who's made a website before? So, we are dealing with the same problems as any website makers. The fonts, um, the, the modern browsers do really what we want browsers to do, but the old browsers don't. So, I like this analogy here with that herd that moves on, but it doesn't move on as quickly as we want. But there is movement, there is improvement. Here, um, nowadays, we can um, reach more than 95% of the browsers with WOF and EOT, with the two real web fonts that are safe enough uh, for the foundries that the foundries would give to you. Um, so that's quite an improvement. Um, but uh, we cannot do completely with WOF. Of course, that would be cool, just really one font file, one WOF for all browsers. And one of the main things that, uh, again, is lagging behind is Internet Explorer here. Internet Explorer 8 is now, has now become the kind of boot anchor that keeps us from, from traveling into the future and progress. So, anyway, what can we do? We, at least with WOF and EOT, we reach many more than two years ago. 2010 was kind of the, the big bang of web fonts, when browsers started uh, supporting web fonts at all. And um, so, compared to that, we can already reach uh, the people with WOF and EOT quite well. Uh, which means that foundries that hand out uh, WAF and EOT only, they tend not to give anyone raw TTFs with which you could cover more or less all browsers. So that means uh, self-hosting services ha are becoming more popular um, the more people you can reach with WAF and EOT only. Speaking of self-hosting, what exactly does he mean? There are two types of using fonts. One is going through a service. That means you would simply paste one simple line of code into your HTML document. Either it's a link to a CSS document or a link to a JavaScript. As I said, not too much difference, really. And the other option would be self-hosting. So you go to the Foundry and you purchase font files, like you would purchase desktop fonts. So you get a WAF and an EOT, and that is more or less probably a, a demo CSS to tell you how to do it. And it's not really that difficult. So these are the two options, self-hosting and services. And uh, Peter Bilak offers both. He runs his own service. Actually, Typotech was the first commercial web fund service at all. And he feels that uh, people are more and more interested in doing self-hosting because you've got the fonts on your own server. So 
people, developers, just feel better with that. If Peters even goes one step further and he said, well, he said one year ago that once uh, the browsers will support WAF and EOT, uh, the web font services will be completely obsolete. Um, now, we do have that situation that WAF and EOT is supported by all browsers, but, well, the, the web font services are still around and they are still very popular, and in fact, hardly any of the foundries is offering self-hosting fonts. You have, I don't know, you have, um, if you're not so into fonts, maybe you don't know that, but there are hundreds of foundries nowadays that are publishing thousands of fonts every year, but I couldn't mention more than, say, five foundries that offer fonts for self-hosting. Um, the reason maybe is that simply still web fonts are new for foundries, and maybe foundries are not taking them that, uh, for that important yet, and producing them is still a bit tricky. Jeremy Tankard, very uh, good designers, uh, designer. Um, the problem is you don't have any font editor yet that does one push, push of a button and you've got your web fonts. The reason is that uh, FontLab, which is the kind of still number one font editor around, unfortunately the current version is uh, five years old now. And then there are two very uh, promising looking new um, font editors that emerged last year. One is Glyphs, one is called RoboFont. But somehow these makers, I mean, they know everything about fonts, but they are just not so interested in web fonts. So their font tools don't have any WAF or EOT export. Anyway, so back to the font. Um, now we've looked at all this question of how they are made, how they are served, but what really counts in the end is, of course, how they look. That's what we're interested in. How, how, what does it look like in the browser? And for that question, uh, none of that is really important, whether you serve it as gzip or as WAF base64 JavaScript, it will render exactly the same. The only thing that really makes a difference is here in the very smallest part of the font, the glyph itself. As I said, there are two flavors of fonts, TrueType and PostScript-based fonts. Whether it's WAF or RAW doesn't really matter. What matters is the, the glyph itself. So you have PostScript contours, and uh, they are drawn with a slightly different mathematics, TrueType curves, but that's not really what makes the difference. The computer doesn't mind whether it um, rasterizes uh, cubic Bezier curves or quadratic ones. That's not the real difference. The, really, the, the real thing that matters, that's conceptually very different, is the hinting. Postscript fonts contain so-called hints. That's each uh, glyph contains a little bit of extra information here, like these green zones, that say to the rasterizer, look, that's, let's call it a stem, okay? This is a stem, that's a stem, that's a stem. Now go ahead and rasterize that, and please make something sensible out of it. So the, the term hints is really uh, quite appropriate, just saying, look, that's a stem, you know. Uh, TrueType works quite different. Uh, while uh, PostScript has a very uh, rather abstract glyph and assumes a relatively smart rasterizer, TrueType has very specific, they are often called instructions, not hints, which is almost better because that's what they are. Very specific instructions that tell the rasterizer exactly what to do, how to tweak the shape as it is converted to pixels. So you have a smart font and a not so sophisticated rasterizer, that's the concept of true type. By the way, Apple renderers completely ignore any hinting in either system, but on Windows, uh, that still matters. So once again, if you have a WAF, it could contain either flavor, we don't know. EOT, on the other hand, can only contain true type. So, next subject. Rendering. As I said, um, hinting has a great impact on rendering. What does rendering mean? We have to somehow convert our abstract, infinitely precise curves somehow into pixels. The most uh, obvious and historically the oldest uh, system would be just black and white pixels, as you know. Then 
uh, in the 90s, people said, ah, yes, well, on screen, the screen doesn't have such a good resolution, but unlike print, we can control the brightness of each single pixel, so we can somehow uh, get more information into this image. And um, so the stem thickness and the details, they are somehow expressed using anti-aliasing, using gray pixels, with the result that in large sizes, these nasty steps disappear, it's just smooth, and in smaller sizes, you just see a bit more of the original design. Uh, the third kind of generation of rendering is subpixel rendering. You always see when you take a screenshot and enlarge it, and if something is colory, then you know that's subpixel rendering. So why, why do colored pixels look better? Why is that done? We have to have a look at the physical properties of the screen to understand that. So you have uh, RGB screens, of course, red, green, and blue, and these red, green, and blue parts of each pixel, they are sitting side by side. They're not on top of each other. The three subpixels are one after the other. So one red, green, and blue oh, together forms one pixel. And if you take a, a magnifying glass, I mean, real physical <laughs> magnifying glass on your screen, you can see uh, that's what it looks like. And I'm, I was quite surprised to see that there isn't even any grouping of this red, green, and blue of one pixel. It is really evenly spaced. So it is an obvious thing to say, well, we are not interested in pixels anymore. We just switch on or off every single subpixel. So what looks like that uh, in, if in an enlarged screenshot is actually that on screen. You have RGB stripes, and you switch them on and off. So if you have a pixel that looks like it's red, that simply means that if you have this kind of white space inside the P, RGB, 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 R, and if R, red, is the last one, well, then just, that just happens to be red. So this is obviously how it works. But then looking at that, it's almost more confusing than the upper one, isn't it? What happens if we take away the color? Ah, that becomes clearer. So it seems like the strategy is to use the subpixels to, well, increase the resolution in horizontal direction. In other words, in that comparison, that to that to that is more like that conceptually, which means compared to non-subpixel rendering, we have a um, Yes, uh, almost three times resolution in X direction. You have a more precisely defined stems. The thickness is represented better. And um, in case you have a subpixel positioning as well, then even the spacing, the rhythm of the font gets improved. Now, of course, the question is, um, which of these principles is used in which case? Black and white, of course, printing cannot switch on uh, or half on or off the pixels. It's either black or white. Very old operating systems also have black or white. You, you might even still remember that. The font itself can contain information and say, oh, up to eight pixels, I want to be rasterized in uh, black and white without anti-aliasing. And uh, Windows respects that. And you can even switch off the, the, the smoothing, the anti-aliasing by CSS. That's respected by MacOS. Um, then you've got grayscale, normal anti-aliasing, which is used in Windows since 95. Back then, I was a Windows user, so unfortunately, I don't know since when, um, since when uh, MacOS does that. Uh, the Flash Player also does uh, grayscale rendering, uh, no subpixel rendering. So that's one small argument, again, for web fonts as opposed to Flash, because the rendering is just a little bit more well-defined. And iOS also doesn't do uh, subpixel rendering. I can only um, make an assumption why. It's probably because as you rotate the device, if you had subpixel rendering, it would constantly have to rethink, of course, because the thing, the physical thing, rotates. So I assume that's why iOS doesn't do subpixel rendering. And of course, the current versions of Windows and MacOS have a proper subpixel rendering. 
and also the Adobe Reader. And the interesting thing is that an Adobe Reader, if you then rotate the page by 90 degrees, it does actually rethink the subpixels. And then you suddenly have a, like a, an increased uh, resolution in Y direction. So that's quite interesting to see. Um, now I'm showing this one here just as one image for MacOS or Windows, but, um, well, as you might have heard, Windows and Mac rendering is not exactly the same. Um, let's have a closer look here. We see uh, in bigger size now, uh, that's grayscale rendering by Apple and subpixel rendering by Apple. I didn't manage to get it somehow to exactly the same alignment and, and height. That's why it looks slightly different here. So subpixels give us more smoothness here around vertical um, curves. And uh, the grayscale version just looks a bit more pixely, um, but it's still smooth. Uh, one more thing about all Apple rendering is that it looks like the underlying ideal shape here was just a little bit higher than that pixel. And because it is just a little bit higher, that is reflected with this sort of gray line of pixels. Um, Let's have a look at Windows. Again, Windows grayscale looks uh, very similar as we could expect it. And then ClearType, ClearType is just another, is just the name that Windows, uh, that Microsoft has given to their subpixel rendering engine. And what we can see here is again, uh, increased resolution here in X direction. But then there's something very strange going on. It seems like someone thought that it's a really good idea to switch off smoothing altogether in Y direction. So what we have is a kind of hybrid of very high resolution um, subpixel rendering and black and white logic in the vertical direction. The result is a bit unfortunate because if you have, especially you see that in large sizes, you have these nasty steps um, sort of, in a way, it's a step back compared to the grayscale, especially in large sizes. Um, and that doesn't have anything to do with a lack of hinting. I think that one here is Georgia, which of course has an absolutely perfect true type hinting. So, um, yes, what can we do? But even Microsoft realized that was not a good idea. And in its latest version of direct write in the, uh, of clear type in the direct write, that's the new uh, graphics API, we have um, smoothing in both directions and subpixel rendering. That's great. And uh, as you can see, um, you still ha you have this, you have a proper black and white here, uh, not a fuzzy gray line on top like on MacOS. So in the end, I would almost say direct write is at the moment the best rendering you could possibly get. Unfortunately, not many browsers really use direct write. Most of them are still based on um, GDI. Uh, the only browsers that, that uses uh, direct write is uh, Internet Explorer 9. And, well, in Firefox, you can switch it on if the user activates it, but I doubt really many of the users do that. All the other browsers still use, um, uh, still use GDI, unfortunately. So um, there's not much we can do. We can, you know, it's not really fashionable anymore to say, please view this page in this or that browser or even operating system. But there's one thing at least we can uh, do from our end as a, as a font maker or as a website maker. And that's uh, because um, this clear type rendering is only applied to true type fonts. Microsoft is much, um, TrueType is much more of a Microsoft thing than PostScript, so they simply don't apply a subpixel, this, um, this kind of rendering to PostScript fonts. So that is one way how we can trigger either subpixel rendering with jaggies here, or not so high resolution, but at least smooth. So that's the one thing we can change from our end, and it's not only a small niche where that applies, but quite a big chunk of the browser market. Everything that's orange here, we can switch by choosing TrueType or PostScript flavored fonts. We can switch between uh, nice and smooth, but grayscale versus um, 
clear type which has uh, these nasty steps in large sizes. Uh, red here means, uh, unfortunately, Internet Explorer up to 8 can only deal with true type based uh, fonts. And green here for me means uh, all the fonts look, look quite okay. Uh, MacOS completely ignores hinting anyway and renders true type and postscript fonts completely identical anyway. And as you probably know, almost all fonts look quite okay. So we can make use of this, at least this one thing we can trigger. And at our own web font service, that means that we have a, that's a display font here, Domus Titling, which we assume will be used only in large sizes. So we serve it as a PostScript based font, which means in GDI based browsers, at least we get, uh, it, it looks much smoother than a, a true type version would. We still have to produce and make the hinting for a, a true type version because of Internet Explorer 6, 7, and 8. But at, I think it is at least a step forward. Similar at TypeKit now, um, those fonts we consider display fonts, we serve a true type based, which as you can see uh, can be quite a dramatic improvement. And uh, that's another example here, Brie Web. Of course, sometimes it can be a tough call for us you can say, well, what is a display font? How do you know whether the user is going to use it in large sizes or not? Well, the answer is we don't really know, but it's a tricky one. We just have to make decisions. At the moment, we just have either this or that. Ideally, you could say, well, make it a user decision, but then that would, again, make the user interface a bit more complicated. Then people would maybe try out this feature on the Mac and say, I can't see any difference. So um, for now, that's our solution. And I think at least uh, it's better than before. So a small summary. Um, the only thing we can really do to improve the rendering on Windows is either choosing PostScript or TrueType flavor, depending on the use. And of course, when we use TrueType, making sure we have good hinting. Now, that sounds easy, but it isn't, as we will see now. Hinting, um, I could probably give, well, at least one presentation only on hinting. I'm trying to make this as concise as possible. Hinting, so what is true type hinting? We have drawn our letter and we have a grid. Of course, it needs to be turned into pixels. The easiest way to turn something into pixels is simply to say, well, whenever the center of the pixel is inside the shape, it becomes black, otherwise not. I'm showing this here with a black and white rendering because it's just easier to show, but the principle is the same. So uh, that doesn't look that great. Um, maybe if we were really lucky, we could actually get a symmetrical O, um, but we aren't. Normally we aren't lucky, so a hinting is kind of about avoiding, uh, well, it's about not relying on your luck. So what hinting does is it doesn't actually tweak the pixels itself. Hinting, true type hinting, means you kind of bend the outline before it is even rasterized. So you would start by saying this point here is snapped to the grid. In other words, the Y value is rounded. Same at the bottom. Same on the sides, that's snapped to the grid. And then we want to make sure that the thickness of this stroke here is kind of appropriate. So it is done in, this, in, a, in a specific order. So after this is done, then this point here holds on to that, keeps its distance, then rounds its distance. And what we have is here, uh, both is two pixels wide, that's what we wanted. And the same thing in a vertical direction, and we have a cleanly rendered um, uh, O. Uh, the good thing is, because it's a kind of abstract system that works in all sizes, whether it's uh, 10 pixels, 20 pixels, or 80 pixels, um, we just say this is rounded, and then this is rounded on the basis of that, and it should work in almost all sizes. Uh, the O. Oh, yes, sometimes you have cases where you think, ah, in that size, now, this is a, what you would call a, a monolinear font. 
where the, there is no really real difference between the horizontal and the vertical strokes, no stroke contrast. But in that case, if you round it, it just happens to have one pixel here and two pixels here. So you could say, ah, I'll bump that up to two, which means two is too much. In that case, it's very good if the, the one who hints it is the di designer himself, as, as it was the case here. And then you can simply make a decision and say, I'm the designer, I'm making this design decision, I want it to be two pixels, or I want it to be one pixel. You have these kind of um, categories here, so you can link each of these things to one category, and then you've got your global, font-wide, kind of remote control for all these links, and then just say, in the whole font, uh, at 16 pixel size, that should become two pixels thick. So that's the O, that's a fairly simple one. Uh, it can become a bit more tricky if you have something like the R. You can have fun playing around. The green I here is an interpolation that keeps its relative position between these. Then it is rounded, then we have the link down, and then we have another interpolation here. So you can have fun there while you're hinting. You can say, ah, let's play around trying this one here first. And uh, now you can see why not all the fonts in the world are hinted yet. It just does take some time. And sometimes you'd also face decisions like the stroke of the R here in some sizes, well, it can only be too high or too low if it's based on whole pixels. And again, as a designer, I can just say, I think too low is a bit better. The E um, here, similar, you can... Um, play around. Sometimes it's interesting to say, I'm not interested in the stroke thickness, but the relation between black and white. And then we're getting very close to what type design ultimately is. It's about white shapes and black shapes and the relation between white and black. So you're kind of turning the logic of the design into these um, instructions here. One aspect is uh, the so-called overshoot. The rounds of the letters are typically drawn in a way that they slightly go underneath the baseline because it looks better. But then if, it is, if that happens at a small size and it becomes one pixel, it just doesn't look right, does it? Here, that A, how the belly is hanging down. So you need something that's called overshoot suppression. On the other hand, you can't simply say, I always suppress the overshoot, I always push that up onto the baseline. In larger sizes, you do want the overshoot. So the question is, where is, well, the threshold? Uh, so you can say, here I've always got overshoot, here I've completely suppressed it, up to which size, uh, or from, from which size does it look right to have one pixel overshoot? So in the small sizes, that looks wrong, that looks better, but in the large sizes, that looks a bit funny, and you do want an overshoot. So, what do you think? At which size do you want to allow the overshoot? Anyone? 50, 52? Looks like you have exactly the same opinion as me. So, I chose 52, which means ultimately that's the behavior of the font. So, just one single value, but I think it's very important to set that really carefully. And sometimes I see fonts that are well-designed, well hinted, oh, and just the overshoot they just didn't set carefully, and then you have these bellies hanging down, that's a pity. So I think that's really important. Here, once again, something we kind of knew already, uh, not well hinted or completely unhinted font in that case here looks funny. We are, tip we are always somehow unlucky. This one, just by coincidence, has two pixels thickness, and if it's hinted, it looks okay. It looks a bit strange and pixely there, but in real one-to-one -one size, that looks quite convincing. So yes, in text sizes, we definitely need hinting. And you might say, yes, but in large sizes, the resolution is high enough, isn't it? So for, bis for display sizes, we don't really need hinting, do we? The answer is, ooh, unfortunately, we still need hinting in large sizes, because if you have this uh, curve here, and then just, just by coincidence, one pixel just still fits in here at the highest point, then it just looks um, quite nasty. We, we call them warts at TypeKit. So, 
Um, hinting is necessary even in large sizes, unfortunately. As I said, these nasty steps from, from clear type, even the best hinting in the world, cannot um, make go away. So at Typekit, um, not all of our fonts are hinted yet. Um, it just, it, it's just a matter of, uh, it takes lots of, it's very labor intensive. So what we do is at least we indicate We've got this button here, recommended for paragraphs. That kind of means, from a technical point of view, that's the hinted fonts. These fonts you can use in small sizes and on, on Windows, and they will look OK. The other way around, you've got the one that's called recommended for headings. And that's the fonts that we serve as PostScript. So um, that's the fonts you can use in large sizes, and they won't show the, the jaggies. Um, Yes, but in the end, don't only rely on the buttons, you still need to test, 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 which means testing on Windows, because, um, as I said, on Mac, kind of everything looks quite okay normally. Uh, ideally, it would be cool, of course, if you could design and test directly, choose the fonts in the browser. Uh, that is the case here in uh, WordPress.com. There is a collaboration with Typekit. And, um, but that's not really, of course, a tool that's used by, by professionals. It's more for lay persons, and uh, including uh, hints like, oh, this font here is not supposed to be for small sizes. Please only use it in headlines. Who knows? Maybe someone would use it otherwise. Or here, uh, about.me. I don't know. Do you know about.me? I think it's a nice site, very simple. You can just make a one page for yourself. Uh, edit visually and uh, choose different fonts, and you see it instantly. So if you design your about.me size on Windows, then you already see uh, what the font looks like. Talking about families, I'm talking about font families, of course. Fonts are nice, even nicer if you have several styles of them, bold, italic, you know what I mean. And they can have even more than just bold italic and bold italic and regular. Um, for example, extra light, light, semi-bold, and so on. Um, unfortunately, not all applications uh, understand that a font can have more than four styles. Many of them do, like all the Adobe apps and all the Apple apps. OK. Um, so, but Microsoft uh, apps don't understand that, so you have to play tricks and uh, make the, the extra bold appear as a separate family, for example. Um, on the internet, everything is much easier because you assign the, the font weight only as you load it anyway, so you have normal or bold, and there is also the possibility to use numbers instead. So 400 is def def by definition normal, 700 is by definition uh, bold, and that allows you then to use uh, several weights in one family. Unfortunately, not all browsers understand these numbers. Microsoft, I'm looking at you. So one, th one workaround would be to simply load this as a separate font family. Um, this is not absolutely working with the web. It's not entirely semantic. But at least as long as you make sure that, for example, your semi-bold is defined as bold and not as regular, then in case your font is not used, you would end up with a bold. Next subject, glyphs. A font is, of course, made of these little drawings, the glyphs, the characters. In the 90s, I don't know whether you still remember, one font actually meant, meant three fonts, because one font, postscript font, can only have 200-something glyphs. And then you had an additional font where you had a Central European encoding, or you had a separate font for only for the small caps. Then came OpenType, and hooray, only one font for all, that's great. You can have as many, fonts, uh, as many glyphs as you want in one font. And the, um, the small caps are activated by OpenType features. These OpenType features, they also work in CSS. You can activate. You need to just know this um, standardized four-letter code, SMCP, small cap. And uh, if you see that in the browser, you can see real small caps and real old-style figures, at least in Firefox. Unfortunately, 
Other browsers don't, under, uh, uh, don't uh, support that yet. Um, now, until uh, a few months ago, I would have said, yeah, you know, uh, even Microsoft Word doesn't support that, so forget about it. That, won't take, that will take a while. But, believe it or not, Microsoft Internet Explorer 10 properly supports all the OpenType features. So the only thing we need to wait for this year is uh, a WebKit to, uh, so Safari and Chrome to um, adopt that. And then, who knows, maybe it will be all much quicker than we thought. Until that's the case, if we want to use small caps right here, right now, in all browsers, we still need to go back. It's almost like stepping back uh, in, in, the, in the technology. At least we don't need three fonts, but only two, because we can still put all these extra exotic characters into one font here. And we can put in all the characters that have Unicode value, including smileys, arrows. You can see, for example, on Twitter, at least uh, the, in, the, in the kind of the font geeks, they love to play around with Unicode values. Of course, Twitter only, only allows raw text as an input. So everything you see here has a Unicode value and can be semantically correctly encoded in a font. Here someone uh, has a star, a star of the week. This guy here even has a little uh, um, shining sun. I don't know whether he updates that when he's in a bad mood. Or, um, so anything that's, that doesn't have a Unicode value, that's tempting to play tricks. For example, there's a font here that's just a few weeks ago. They have the States of America, A, B, C, D, E, and if you switch to that font, you get the States. It's just one problem if you read that in like Instapaper or Reader, it shows A, B, C, D, E. And well, at least they are aware of that problem here, so you can't blame them for that. So um, it's always nice to play tricks, and hacks are cool and fun, but that one here, I would say, no, don't do that. Another thing here, ligatures. Ligatures are where two characters are joined into one shape, and it is defined in the font itself. You say F followed by I, replace that with the FI. Here you've got a website. I'm loading the font here, that's in that case my own web font service. And what you see here is just some CSS that's loaded, as you could look up if you want. And on the website here, we can see FI works very well. And um, we had the talk about um, accessibility uh, earlier, which I found very interesting. And it is very important. So how about what if we copy and paste that? Uh, here, I've pasted it in here. Yes, it works. Another test here, Chrome. Yes, it also works the same. In Chrome, it only works because in my CSS here, I smuggle in this CSS thing, optimize legibility, um, and that switches on the ligatures in Chrome. Um, another look. Oh, Internet Explorer doesn't work. But then Unicode to the rescue. As I said, uh, the glyphs have Unicode values, also the ligatures. So we could simply say FB001 is the FI. We can enter that in our source code, and wow, it does work, even in Internet Explorer. And another test about copy and pasting. What happens? I'll paste that into the text editor here, and it looks quite funny because it's a uni uh, monospaced font. You can see it is literally one character, FI. And that, in a way, the browser is doing exactly what it should do. It is preserving the raw text. But it is completely wrong. It looks right, but it is wrong. I don't know what the screen reader does with that. I don't know what the Google robot does with it. Or maybe some other things that we don't even think about at the moment. So again, it's a hack. It looks right, but it's wrong. Um, I'll quickly skip that one. Here's another hack. Say, if you want to use this alternate A with a tail. Unfortunately, we don't want to rely on open type features. So one possibility is to say, I'll simply build one font that contains only this alternate A with the tail. And by the way, that's a font that contains only the small caps. So this is a tiny font file that contains only one font, uh, one glyph. Then you can load that here using font face. 
This is some font with the alternate A. And then in that span here, you use this one here. And now it becomes interesting. You use this. You surely know that when you define several fonts in a row, saying use that if the first one doesn't work. And then you've got comma Verdana, comma Arial, comma Sans Serif, and so on. So we're using that system, but not only as an emergency, but we know exactly what is going to happen. If you use that word play here, for the A, that this fallback mechanism works character by character. So for the A, it does find that alternate A in this font. And for the P, L, and the Y, it falls back to the second font. And uh, similar here for the small caps. So that's another hack. But I think it's a clean hack. It is working with the web. So I think that's something I can recommend trying. Um, talking about glyph sets, of course, we cannot have every, uh, no designer has the time to design every single uh, character that could possibly be used in the world. So we have to somehow restrict that. And of course, on the internet, we are restricted by data volume. So we have to somehow restrict the, uh, the character set. And of course, often enough, you know roughly which characters are going to be used. Here, that's a blog by an American uh, that's using the um, just to be launched a web font service by the American foundry Heffler and Freya Jones. That's called Ideal Sense here, that font. And well, it's unlikely that he will use exotic ac accented characters. But you never know. Of course, he's got comments. So you've got many websites where you cannot really know which characters are going to be used because you've got other input from, by comments. So what would happen if someone uses a character that's simply not there in the font? That's a problem that uh, exists not only on the internet, but also in print. Uh, poor Mitya Miklavcic, uh, he's a very good type designer, by the way. He's the designer of FFTSA, a very popular web font. And he's unlucky to have um, a Slovenian accented characters here. And so he's getting these not so nice fallback fonts. Um, similarly on the web, assuming that's our source code, that's normally what would happen. It will, if you specify that font, ideal sense, comma, Verdana, of course you would choose something that looks kind of the same. You would get this, hmm, not ideal. But there is a special trick here that uh, Heffler Fred Jones apply. They simply take the C, the normal C, and give it this code of the C with this hot check um, in addition. So the C jumps in and say, oh, I can do that. So of course, it looks much nicer. Um, but it is a bit debatable. If you look at something like Polish here, um, again, here you have this. This is how it would work normally. Here it's with their special trick. You use the normal E. And uh, well, I'm not so sure about Polish. One thing I can definitely tell, you've got one real character in here, but that one isn't. So that already tells me it's not, not ideal. And um, I don't know how important these are in Polish, but uh, so I asked uh, Adam Twadoch. He's a, he is Polish. And he happens to be one of the best font experts in the world. And he said, no, that's going too far. And one thing he also pointed out, which I find very interesting, that's something like it's, it's happening behind your back. There is no notification. If there was a hack when the font could tell you, of course, it's impossible. But if the font could tell you, warning, here something has been tweaked. Um, but it, it, there is no notification. So that's a hack that is really, I think, going too far. Similar here, Tokyo ideally should be written with these bars over the O because it's long, it's Tokyo. Uh, but everyone has seen this so many times without, so we know what it means. But then you've got something Yuki, that means uh, courage or bravery, and the font simply turns it into Yuki, which means snowflake, or which means snow. So the font is kind of changing the meaning, which probably isn't right. So I'm not sure about this. It seems like an interesting, interesting trick, but so maybe it's not really thumbs down, but you know, that one at best. So very quick, just the future. Um, I'm trying to, um, at least as a font designer, um, I'm now aware that the, currently the font I'm designing, which is literally that one here, uh, it's the first time I'm really aware that probably it will be used more on screen than on paper. 
maybe not instantly when I start selling it, but in the next few decades, hopefully it will be used, uh, it will be read more on screen. So I'm also testing it on screen. Of course, I still do my printouts, but it's really convenient. On Firefox, you can just say, use my font for any website, no matter what they say, and I can test my font every day. I can just read the internet, uh, read the news in my font. I've got very well-designed layouts, of course. I can see it in real life. And if I forget for a second that this is only in my browser, I can even dream that the whole internet is using my font. <laughs> anyway, so the question is, do I, does it really affect my design, testing the font online? Um, there is surprisingly little I can actually say there is screen-specific design. There's one aspect, though, that uh, I noticed. Here I'm showing, you surely know that font, that's uh, Verdana, very good on screen, very readable. But this is not the real Verdana. There's one thing I manipulated. Does anyone know? What's wrong about it? I made the word space too small. So this one down here, that's the real Verdana with proper word space quite generous, and here this is what I just did as a demonstration. So, one reason why I think Verdana is extremely readable, because it has a very nice, generous word space. So, you might have a font that uh, just somehow doesn't work well on screen, and you don't know why. Maybe it's just the word space. So, you could just try bumping up the word space, and maybe magically it will certainly be, uh, suddenly be readable. Increasing the word space is possible with CSS, that one here, word spacing. And uh, I can really recommend, don't be shy, you know, play with your font, it's yours. Um, you could say in, uh, in the headline, maybe you want to make the letter spacing tighter, that suddenly looks much nicer. And then you can also maybe even decrease the word spacing. And of course, just for completeness, always set the line height consciously. Don't just use the default that's in the font. So these are the three things here, the only three things of a font that you can override, that you can tweak to a design, make use of it, use it consciously, and then maybe you end up with a website where they will say, oh, that looks really convincing, I don't know what it is, but, you know, and you know it's these things, three things, set them consciously. So for me, it is a bit um, tempting to say, this is my own font now, I'm saying, um, well, but if I make it really small word space, um, the overall texture of that paragraph looks much more even. But I said, no, this is not the right time for vanity. I'll give it a proper word space, makes it more legible. Maybe it looks a bit less even, the texture of the paragraph, but there we go. I'll skip these with one very last quote. Um, in the end, Typography, good typography is ty good typography, whether it's on paper or on screen. If you want to get into it, you can easily just get a, a, a guidebook or make a course on normal typography and apply it on the screen. In the end, the way our eyes work is uh, still the same. That's it. Thank you very much. Mm.